You ready, buddy? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I have alcohol, we're good to go. <laughs> All right, everybody. So uh, to kick off the afternoon, um, uh, right after this talk, we're going to have a little bit of a raffle from the Cisco people for some books, etc. cetera. Uh, but welcome to our afternoon keynote. And this here is Mr. Chris Roberts. Mr. Chris Roberts. You guys hear me? No. You guys hear me in the back? No. No. Nicely no. 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 working. You guys hear me in the back okay? <coughs> Good. All right. For those of you that are on stage for the rest of the afternoon, we now have alcohol up on stage. <laughs> it has got to that time of the day. All right, let's start this one off. We'll start with the easy slide. For those of you who are aware of my challenging situations last year, um, it was requested that I spend a lot of time talking about rainbows and bunnies and unicorns. This is the slide that if any of you have a rest capability, or have the desire to actually have me taken out and arrested or tasered, this is the slide for you. As nice as I can put it, look at it, accept it, and then get the fuck out of here. <laughs> this is not today's topic, because I would like to actually maintain my flying status with the small number of airlines that will still let me fly. <laughs> I will, however, have one slide on this whole shenanigans. Um, yeah, it's, you're going to have to accept the fact there's bits on the left and the right, the center. For any of you that read the frickin' affidavit, they managed to compress five years worth of research and a bunch of conversations that we tried to have with the various different organizations into a couple of paragraphs, completely got it wrong, had absolutely no chance of spelling half the damn stuff correctly, and kind of screwed it up. Obviously, it wasn't ac accurately represented. And obviously, uh, on the 2015 flights, not too much was done. Um, this is being recorded, so if you wouldn't mind putting that down, or are you just taking a picture? There we go. Well done, that man. All right, so let's get on to the talk. Beauty of humans. For all that we are, we have an equal capacity to evolve. It's one of those very nice, fuzzy statements that says, ah, oh, we screwed up, but let's give ourselves a chance. You know, we're humans, we get the chance to evolve. From a security standpoint, we have, we are, and we continue to be the weakest link. And here is part of the problem why. When we have to put signs up saying, don't fondle or molest the crocodile, hold on to the chainsaw by the right end, and leave the burning building before you fucking tweet, we have a problem with society. It ain't pretty. So what do we decide to do about it? Long story short, Jesse, myself, and a couple of others reopened the research that we did several years ago on agriculture. The whole concept here was basically taking away the human survival requirements. We'll go into this. We needed people to pay attention, so we figured we'd try and get their attention. Now, about halfway through this presentation, if you're going, oh shit, I never really thought about this kind of problem then you are the kind of people that need to go out, buy some barbecue sauce, and a couple of self-adhesive sticky labels. We will explain why later. The logic being here, we're all targets. We know we're all targets. The organizations that we work for, is that because I stood somewhere? Hello? The organizations that we work for are, organ are targets. And the problem that we seem to have is what the hell is it going to take for everybody to actually wake up and understand that we're targets? At this point, I'm going to put a caveat in. And the reason there's a caveat in, I just came back from Tel Aviv. And the very first opening talk on Tel Aviv, uh, especially security B-sides on Tel Aviv, was all about responsible disclosure. Some of you are aware, I take that idea and I do throw the occasional rock at it or I throw this at it. <laughs> now, we like to mess with physics. So third law of motion. I would argue that we could actually disprove the theory of the third law of motion, because basically, from our standpoint, every action does not necessarily result in an equal and opposite reaction. Occasionally, the reactions we get to what we're doing, some are acceptance. Yes, we have a problem. We'll deal with it. Or denial. 
You bastards, you can't do that. You can't hack my system. Cooperation is an occasional one, but more often than not, it's like, oh shit, we're on another government list. <laughs> the discussion, what the f is this the beard that's getting in the speaker? I'm nowhere near the fucking speaker. <laughs> All right. The questions and the ideas here are what do we have to do and how can we actually control, maintain, or manage that equation? When we're doing it, we have to look at the playing field that we are creating for ourselves. Standard statistics, by 2020, approximately 4 billion people out of about 7.8, 7.9 on the planet that are going to be connected. This is what I love, 25 million apps out there. This is awesome. As far as I'm concerned, 24.9 million of them, nobody's going to have even thought about security until at least release 2 or release 3. At which point, obviously, it's too late because the rest of them have gone playtime. All of this, and then we start taking those numbers down. Of the 4 billion connected people, if we put a standard bell curve in place, we assume that 15% of the people understand security. 70% are sheeple, and the other 15% are on the top 20 LinkedIn list of passwords. 1 through 6, password 1, you get the idea. Start breaking those further from a USA-centric, about 4.4 of the population is American. Ish. 26 million people approximately of, would be the 15%, which equates to about 15, about 8% of the US population. So when you are addressing the audiences and the people that you talk to and everybody inside your organization that you have to actually be the security evangelist for, at most, 8% will get the idea and the concept of security. Which kind of brings us to this one. <laughs> So, 8% kind of get it. We're going to worry about the other 92%. What do we do with them? Do we try to bring them along and help them understand security? And if we do, we need to change the approach and change the tactic. So we decided to go after basically agriculture, because there's lots of fun things to play with. Almost 39 billion bushels of corn to mess with. There's one and a half billion cows. We'll get to war driving cows in a minute. <laughs> Man, is it fun. You get the idea. There is shit ton loads of stuff to play with. It really does bring a whole new meaning to gold milk. So why? Why do we do this? From our standpoint, inside the organization I'm causing chaos with these days, we have a Jesse. Some of you have met Jesse. He makes me look small. He's bigger than I am. He's wider than I am. He's Nebraska corn fed. And he wears overalls all the time. And he bloody does. And more importantly, we listen to him. Because your average APTs, your code attacks, and all this kind of fun, crazy shit that we deal with doesn't really mean much to the 92%. They don't give a flying fucking fudge bar if you can reverse engineer their cell phone and go, ha ha, I've got your data. Who gives a shit? If you steal their credit card, and you one turns up in the post in three days' time. You steal their identity, eventually you get a new one. Somebody's been filing my taxes for the last four years, for fuck's sakes. <laughs> Just wish they'd do it properly. I'd pay them, actually, probably more than they try to get out of the system. But the real thing here is, okay, when we have these conversations, we talk to the 8% at most. How the hell do we get the other 92% of people to pay attention? Well, we hack milk. The start. So I'm going to pick on England. Actually, England's funded. How many of you guys have been following this freaking Britain exits the Euro shit? Holy, why the fuck couldn't Scotland do that? <laughs> <laughs> they might do. So we're picking on England because there's too many freaking English people in Scotland, which is why we didn't get the independence in the first place. And in doing so, we're going to go after proper intelligence gathering. The whole concept here is pick a target. In this case, we went after an organization called Forward. We did our research. We did the analytics. We understood our target. And in doing so, the nice thing about these guys is they gave us an entire list of who has their hardware, their software, and their systems, including where they are and exactly how many cows they had. So once we'd figured all of this out, we realized across basically England, Wales, a little bit of Scotland, and most of the Netherlands, we had on hand to play with about one and a half to two million cows to fuck around with. 
<laughs> oh, you yeah, it ain't started. At least they're not sheep. <laughs> Different accents. Mm -hmm. So we do our research, and this is where, I've got a squirrel moment in a second, but this is where you actually research something. You can use the open source intelligence, the human intelligence gamut. For crying out loud, Google's your fun. An extremely good friend invented the whole concept of Google hacking for crying out loud. Read the books, do the research, and figure it out yourselves. The forums are awesome. We tend to forget that. In this case of Fullerwood, you've got the guys who are coding their software, sitting on Java forums and SQL forums, explaining they can't get the back-end database to work. So being the really nice, helpful people that we are, we asked them to, you know, hey, give us some code. We'll take a look at it for you. So we did, <laughs> including all the embedded IDs and passwords. I mean, we're good people. We're nice citizens when we do this stuff. The stuff that we have here. So. On a side thing, for those of you that know me, I had uh, an organization, but we've been messing around with darknet hunters. We basically built a tool that brings in about 35 million pieces of data every single day, has some fun with it. Inside that tool at the moment, we have about three quarters of a million Cisco architectures. So when the Cisco admin goes, oh shit, I've got a problem, and dumps the entire config on the database and goes, hi, can somebody help me? We have those. How many of you actually go out to the forums and look at that data on behalf of your own organizations? Not many. So we will have a squirrel moment for a second, because this talks about threat fucking intelligence. How many of you guys have seen buzzword bingo threat intelligence? I almost need to take a drink for this, for God's sakes. Good God. Log correlation is not threat fucking intelligence. Log analysis inside your own company is not threat fucking intelligence. Looking on pastebin is not threat fucking intelligence. It's better than most places will do. But for crying out loud, when the vendor turns up and goes, hi, I've got a new threat intelligence platform, after you've tasered their sorry ass, <laughs> start asking them the awkward questions like, hi, how much dark net, deep net, how much open source intelligence do you bring? How much correlation do you do? How much language translation do you do? How much natural language processing, contextualizations, what threat actors are you bringing in? Who the fuck outside of my four walls actually cares about my data? If they can answer those questions, then maybe they're on the first or second rung of threat intelligence. But if they come in and say, hey, we do log correlation, and we correlate it with these six feeds, taser them, then tar and feather them, then put it on YouTube. <laughs> <sighs> All right, rant over. So you've done your intelligence gathering. You've done your understanding of the company. You figured out who to dead after. Now we hack. I love this one. Do you guys recognize it? Warlock. And this is what you end up with. Those four screens are live screenshots courtesy of milk marketing and milking machines. Milk robots are freaking awesome. They take the cow, they weigh the cow, they analyze the cow, they shuffle it along a bit, they hook up to its udders, they suck all the damn milk out, and while they're doing it, they can actually inject antibiotics into the damn thing. And they can also put shit into the milk to make sure the pH balances and all this stuff goes. Now, if you've got access to it through basically terminal server, Windows shell, or anything else that you need to, you can also fuck around with what goes into the milk. And you can make the cow higher by giving it more antibiotics. <laughs> it's awesome to play with. We have this currently running on about 150, 200 milking machines across the UK and across the Netherlands. Why? Because they use PC Anywhere, VNC, Terminal Server, and this really secure thing called the cloud. And of course, it's Windows. <sighs> you have some fun. I love that one. I take no credit for that. I found that one on good old internet. So, the fun thing about this shit is they've actually hooked up the cows to the internet as well. It's freaking awesome. So, active RFID tags that can be monitored from the comfort of your cell phone. While driving across Wyoming not that long ago, I was actually heading out to see some friends. I stopped it in the middle of Wyoming. I'm, I'm, I got the laptop next to me and I was messing around. I'm like, oh shit, cows, they had a mesh grid network that was running across the whole section. 
ended up moving the cows in the RFAD active from where they were grazing happily in the field, ended up moving them to the top of some mesa about 15 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same thing in Utah. So there's now several herds of cows, not where they probably should be. If you really want to manage, how many of you guys did war driving years ago? I used to have an old Volvo, and we had about a three and a half, four foot parabolic dish hooked up to a, it was a Radio Shack rotational antenna. In the back of the car, we used to go war driving. I'm taking that same rig, I'm going cow driving. I'm seriously, I've got a billion and a half targets to fuck around with. Anyway, so cows in the cloud, pedometer, pedometers for cows. This is awesome. We did a whole bunch of hacking. How many of you guys have got these stupid bloody Fitbits? They're all, I mean, seriously, there's some, I, I think I've put some of the Bluetooth code out there now. But we reverse engineered the Bluetooth system. And the nice thing about the, uh, the, uh, the Fitbit is it actually unauthenticated, drops off several pieces of information. You can pull the source code off of um, JetBrain and GitHub. But if you pull the intel off, you can actually turn your Fitbit into an active Fitbit. So as you're walking along, it will associate with other people's Fitbits and pulls in their steps. <laughs> so you imagine how much fun you can have with the freaking cows doing this shit. There's one cow going, shit, I can't keep up. And all the others are going, well, fuck it, you've got all of our steps. <laughs> Four-digit passcodes is actually really, really good for most of them as well. So, as you can probably imagine, this shit ain't going to end well. <laughs> this, how long does it take to find a freaking polar bear doing this shit on your Google? <laughs> All right, so, we've got the milk, the electronics in the milking system, the vaccination system, the timing system, all of the date system, the, the herd ID. I mean, this is the other thing. You've got a million and a half cows. You can swap ownership of cows. We were talking about it yesterday. Jesse and I were talking. And I'm like, you know what? With this whole Britexic thing, we're going to move all the English cows and move them over to the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and can anybody... What the hell happens when you stop milking a cow? Does it just explode? Does it just get bigger? It's, it, what the hell happens? Anyway. Something to take to the organizations that you work for and you work with or you consult to or whatever. It's like the mantra. You have risks in the organizations. Obviously, a lot of us do research, be it part-time, full-time, whatever. How do you understand the risks? And then as we bring the risks to you, how do you actually react? And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a little bit. But it's trying to actually balance this out. Many of us have a lot of fun doing this stuff. It isn't just a job, it's kind of like a side hobby and a fun craziness. And it's how do we actually get the word out on this one. Now in saying that, how many of you are red team guys who consult and walk into companies and do this for a living? Some of you. Nobody wants to put their hand up at the moment because nobody wants to be abused. <laughs> so we came up with this a little while ago because we were getting fed up of going to companies and going, hi, you have a problem. They're like, oh no, we're fine, fuck off. So we're like, okay, let's do an escrow challenge. And I challenge any of you, when you're talking to the client who's obstropera, stubborn, and believes that they're perfect, to say this and use this in front of them. You don't believe you have a challenge? Put your freaking money where your mouth is. Put the money that you would spend in escrow. I don't want it. Put it in escrow. It's safe there, isn't it? And if we fail to get in, you keep the money. We'll write you a nice report. We'll even put the tick in the PCI box for you. <laughs> I mean, who audits? How many, how many of you guys audit or want to admit to auditing? It's like, I'm sorry, I'm a recovered auditor. I actually feel sorry for the freaking auditors. I really do. I mean, the whole concept, bring them in, help them understand the environment they're meant to be working in. What do we do? We bring them in, we lock them in a room. We do not let them go to the bathroom. We don't feed them, water them, and we feed them shit until they put a tick in the box and say, you've passed PCI. And yet we still pay them money to help understand what the issues are. Something screwed up in there. All right. So we've identified the issues. We've gone, ha-ha, you're screwed. And this, unfortunately is what we would prefer that happens. Why? Because this is really what we want to have happen. Cooperation and balance. When we research, and we can use the stuff we did with the airlines, 
We researched from about 2011 to about 2013. We sat in the airline industry's senior executives' offices and said, you've got a fucking problem. We sat in the airline industry's third-party offices and said, you have a problem. And all the infotainment companies, and nobody listened. Then we handed all that research over to the government and said, they've got a fucking problem. And nobody listened. So we went, fuck it, let's go public. And then we get banned from all the airlines. But what do we do? The best? Can we cooperate? Is there a balance? Can we, as research and as security guys, find some kind of middle ground where responsible disclosure works, where I am the cavalry actually works and we can get results and actually see things happening? I'm not sure, but we'll talk about that. So, let's deal with the 92 percentile, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't take long to find on the internet. <laughs> All right, so we've taken the milk. All joking aside, the fact I can get the cows high and I can adjust all of the milk also means I can kill the cows. I overdose their antibiotics, I screw around with their systems, now we have a lot of dead cows. And I can also poison the milk. So we've taken the milk out of the system. We do the same thing to the Wheaties and Cheerios. There's currently a whole bunch of Wheaties machines sitting with a very particular company that are reporting back to me instead of reporting back to their vendor. I'm waiting until the vendor suddenly realizes there's a whole swathe of basically Cheerio machines that aren't reporting to them. But we have them, so what can we do to them? Well, we can fuck around with the Cheerios. Instead of getting small Cheerios, you get donut-sized Cheerios. <laughs> We can mess around with the code, we can mess around with the quality, we can mess around with the nice little timestamps on the same thing, and the date and timestamps. The farm animals are dead. I like my stuff organic, I like it free range, I like to have this nice hippie view that everything's running around happily until somebody kills it and puts it on my damn plate. What I don't like is when you've got a million chickens inside a small farm. But what I can do to relieve that issue is I can adjust the temperature controls or I can adjust the feed control systems. I can cook the chickens, freeze the chickens, starve the chickens, or overfeed them. At which point now you've got a million dead chickens. Solve the problem. Haven't exactly made PETA or any of the friends of the earth happy, but I've solved my own problems. Same thing with pigs, same thing with other other things. You can screw with their food supplies. Very easy, PLC controllers, SCADA controllers, you name it, it's all fun things to do. And you can get to it wirelessly, remotely, all that other stuff. Years ago, Jesse and I messed with crops. We basically went back and did the same thing again. The smiley face that we put in John Deere's source code on their assembler systems they have in the nice things, we put it in there five years ago. The smiley face is still there. They haven't fixed their shit. Oh, and if anybody fancies going off to Monsanto, I think we can probably put a nice bug bounty out there, and about half of the farmers will pay. I apologize for anybody that messes around with critical infrastructure, but it's the same problem. We all know that there are issues and challenges there. The PLCs, the smart devices, the whole bunch of backdooring. Did any of you guys see there was a, one of the research, actually, he published the, uh, the cease and desist and legal letter that was sent to him. It was a smart device controller dealing with the electrical grid system, and he published a vulnerability, and then he published the cease and desist letter they sent to him. The stuff's got issues. Um, obviously, the thing is, don't hit the core. I was up in Michigan, and we, uh, we did a live demonstration of having some fun with that really nice pipeline that goes all the way across upper Michigan. It's easy stuff to get into. And if you don't want to hack the core system itself, go after the vendors, go after the suppliers, go after the third party, party organizations. So at this point in time, potentially, we've taken your milk, we've taken your food, we've taken your water, we've taken your electricity, we've messed with the gas supply things, and we've done it in a non-violent and non-confrontational manner. I have not had to cover myself in blue, stand on the top of my wall and yell at the top of my voice in an Australian accent or whatever that little asshole was. <laughs> we haven't had to declare war. We've shut everything down. We've messed around with everything. And basically, at this point in time, you're hungry, cold, thirsty, and wet. Which is when we come back to the barbecue sauce. Now, to Jesse's point, the farmers will likely survive. One, because they can produce crops, and secondly, they have guns. Those of us who can utilize our hands and can also lay our hands on weaponry will also survive as well, because if we don't have the food, we'll steal it from somebody else, probably the neighbor next door who is a hippie. 
<laughs> the geeks, the geeks are screwed. If you can't use, you know, if you can't grow food and you can't shoot anything, you might as well just cover yourself in barbecue sauce and slap an eat me post-it note on. We have at this point re-entered the Stone Age. <laughs> I actually had the tactical facepalm, and I wasn't sure if it was a double facepalm or a tactical facepalm moment. Now, to bring it back into reality, we haven't touched a single frickin' iPod, iPhone, Internet of Thing bloody device. We haven't had to screw around with APTs. We haven't had to mess around with anything really on the Internet of Things. Hopefully at this point in time, the hungry man in the street who's part of the 92 percentile might actually be paying attention. We haven't touched any of that shit. What we have done, though, is take over all of this. Now, for any of you who can see, there's a Roomba in the middle. It's freaking awesome. It's like a, it's, it sits in the farm and it goes up and down the lines with the cows and it can do feeding and it can also do cleanup. We've got code running on a whole bunch of these things in Wyoming, Utah, and I think Kansas, I think was the other place that we have them. I can't remember because I didn't geofence the damn code, which is my own problem. So now they're infecting themselves. But every six hours, instead of this thing cleaning up, it stops and spends the next 30 seconds doing a line dance. It's awesome. And then it carries on again. So there's some farmers phoning into this damn manufacturer going, Son, you are never going to believe this shit. <laughs> it's awesome. And Geo bloody freaking plotting this shit out. We actually sat there on the floor with plot graphs trying to figure this stuff out. We managed to stuff it into about 20 lines of code. So in theory, we've dealt with the 92%. So now we have to deal with the 8%. And this is where it gets interesting, because there's part of us which go, we'll deal with them. But there's also another part of us which is basically fed up with dealing with them, with the companies and the organizations which, quite honestly, don't give a shit until it's too late. With the individuals, not necessarily us, but with everybody around us, who basically think that security is somebody else's problem. It's a little frustrating. Because quite honestly, it's fairly rare that we run into an organization or a company which does take a proactive view of security. Doesn't just buy the latest frickin' firewall, but actually thinks more than one step ahead of themselves. And then the company that keeps it up, one of the things that we get involved in and something I'd encourage you guys is, is that we really sit there and when we're going into security, it's not like, aha, I can sell you a new firewall and that's, it's the end of it. No, this whole shit is a journey. It is nothing more than a game of chess when we play security. And we tend to forget that when we're actually talking to organizations. And the organizations themselves tend to forget it about a year into implementation. One, because we're not good at giving metrics. I listened to a couple of talks where they're like, well, we can't give statistics. Bullshit. I would argue you can give statistics. You can put metrics in place to help understand the value of security. Fuck sex. You can put a maturity model in place that helps the executives understand where they are, where they're going to be, and where they have to be. It's a simple thing, and it helps those that are not the geeks understand what they should be doing. Because this is what we end up with. I can take a drink while we're doing this. So, why is this? Because here's the breakdown of the 8%. Arguably, the CEO and the CFO don't give a damn until they've been breached, at which point all hell breaks loose, they wave their hands, they point and shout, and then they spend nine times as much money as they have to trying to fix the frickin' problem. The accountants don't care. The lawyers get paid either way. Let's face it, they get paid if they get breached, they get paid to keep you out. The doctors? Too frickin' narcissistic or too focused elsewhere? How many of you have to deal with healthcare? Arguably yes, arguably no. Saving a patient's life is one thing. Fucking it up for the next three to four years because you didn't encrypt the hard drive, lost their data, or their medical records is something entirely different. It shouldn't be. It's the same fucking thing. Think of the patient one way only. Bankers only care if PCI is involved, see retailers. The other issue I have. DEFCON is on what, 24 this year? We've stood on stage for 24 years going, 
this shit's broken. It feels like we've said it to the same audience. Now that same audience has gotten bigger, rather than having six, seven hundred of us running around in Vegas causing chaos and mayhem, we're God knows how many thousands now. Yet we keep saying the same message. Arguably, I don't think anything's changed. I had a good conversation about this over in Tel Aviv. Um, I did B-Sides Tel Aviv last week or earlier this week. And the question really came up is like, well, we've progressed the security. Yes, we have. We've actually fixed a lot of shit, but the broken stuff has increased exponentially. The amount of data that we have to protect has increased even more so. So it feels like we're still backpedaling. So what the hell do we do with it? Here's a couple of solutions. I don't want to be the poster child for this, and I don't advocate that anybody is, but it would be interesting if you got prosecuted because you broke in to the company, you bastard, and you fixed the passwords, you encrypted the hard drives, you VLAN segmented the freaking network, and then you handed them the keys and got the hell out of there. You still had the fun of breaking in, you still had some red team exercises, but you fixed everything. And the same with SCADA. Aside from having a little bit of fun with the power stations and having some fun with the lights making blinking we will rock you, you actually fix the controllers. You sort the architecture out and then you leave the keys behind you. I like this one. It's an engineering approach to it. Now, should we do this? I'd argue yes. Because quite simply, a secure system is less likely to leak data. The data encrypted at rest. I need a little line, or a freaking taser line or something that says do not cross. Data at rest. Data in transit that's encrypted correctly is less likely to be sold on the open dark net. Less people lost their credentials, in theory, we'd have less of an issue and less of a burden on the financial system and a whole bunch of other things. The problem is, at this point, we're not necessarily always dealing with logic. This tends to be what we end up with. So for me, and for the team, and for a lot of us, the next time we research, the next time we get invited to stand up on stage, just as I'm about to do, I don't say that we stand up here and go, we're all screwed. I say that we go, hey, we're all screwed. But by the way, I also say that here's a couple of fixes. And there's an argument to say, when we figured out the fixes, we should simply just deploy the ready things. Here's the logic. Yes, that actually does sit in the screen. OK, so there's a couple of papers out there. And a very good couple of friends have actually put some stuff out. But we decided to take it about the last 18 months and have some fun with it. Take the best part of a virus. There's some really, really innovative ones out there. We all catch them in the wild and we have fun with them. Take the best part of their deployment methodology, be it an IRC channel, be it I2P channels, be it all sorts of other nice covert channels. Obfuscation and fragmentation techniques. Logic being, if you're going to actually build a vaccine, you don't want the damn thing found. Put an update architecture, then deploy it. We've had it running for a while. It's actually been running for about the best part of about 12 months in some places. The rest of it's been running for about six months. Still working out some of the kinks. When we first deployed it about 12 months ago, unfortunately, I didn't put any geofencing in. So we deployed it in Africa, and it went woohoo and spread rather quickly. But at the moment, it's sitting on about 1.2 million computers over in Africa and a couple of other countries where I forgot to geofence it, but no, that's my problem. They're not attacking us. They're not being used as part of a botnet. They're not getting any kind of abuse against them. Nobody's trying to hack into them. And it basically sits underneath the antivirus. I don't care if they patch. I don't care if they use AV. Didn't ask anybody to do it. Nobody's been harmed. Nothing's taken and nothing's stolen. It's simply a vaccine. And they're also protected against abuse. A few rules might have actually been bent in the process but it is what it is. So, there will be a few people who will be thinking there's an evil overlord part in this one, but there isn't. There's no backdoors in this code. 
Only two people have access to the code. Jesse is the other one. And I would love to see somebody try to get it out of him. The fact he doesn't understand the fucking code is one thing altogether. <laughs> but the fact that I'd love to see somebody try to get the source review out of him, there's no master plan to take over the world. This is quite simply, I am fed up to the back teeth of cleaning up after people. I'm fed up to the back teeth of seeing, in the case of this, about two million computers be used for botnet architecture, be used for harvesting data, be used for obfuscation, all sorts of fun shit. There's simply a desire to see change, which is where we get to the altruistic hacking. And this is some slippery roads, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I actually don't see a problem with it in certain circumstances. Whole lot of embedded systems. We took about 25 million apps that are getting put out there, ignoring the fact that God knows how much crap is out there already, of which probably about a third of the vendors have gone bust or have no clue how to fix it or decide that they want to ring fence it and hope for the best. And a lot of the manufacturers ignore the issues. Something's got to change. Geek thoughts for a second. I do wish. Well, you can actually see most of that. So the next time those of us who actually get to break into shit for a living, take the PCAP file, take the screenshots, and then fix the bloody system. Don't just sit there and gloat up on stage as to what's gone wrong and why it's all a problem. Put a bloody fix in place, or at least come armed with a fix. Because the whole concept of, well, we can't do it, or we haven't got the ability to do it. The next time a vendor, We've dealt with healthcare. The next time a vendor in healthcare turns around to me and says, that machine over there, well, you can't scan it because it'll break it. Or you can't scan it because, fuck it, taser the vendor until they actually fix their fucking code. Oh, we can't update it. It's running on Windows XP and it's all stable unless you actually fart in its general direction. <laughs> well, congratulations. Let me introduce you to Mr. Taser here. <laughs> It's bullshit answers, yet we continue to put up with it. The very worst, or the very least, VLAN it, segment it, and put it aside somewhere. How many of you guys have to deal with cyber liability insurance? E gods. That's another group of individuals who need to be shot. <laughs> I'm almost out of alcohol, we should have more. This is the other, I mean, it's the other issue. Now, we're, we're having some fun with this. Because the people, see, step back for us. How are we doing time-wise? We good? Yeah, we're good. PCI. PCI is actually sneaky. It doesn't just ask you, do you have a firewall? It does ask the follow-on question, is it turned on? <laughs> HIPAA. HIPAA is sensible enough to go, do you have a firewall? And then it goes, well, to the best of your capability and ability, giving you a bit of a hug, um, would you mind turning it on, please? <laughs> the cyber liability insurance people go, do you have a firewall? They don't ask, is it out of the shrink wrap? And this is one of my problems. Now, we're trying to actually combat that by do a doing a bunch of work with those guys to educate them. Number one, obviously, they've been losing their asses for the last couple of years because they haven't asked the follow-on questions. But number two, they haven't actually had anybody to sit down and really educate them. So we're trying to change that. All right, squirrel moment for a second. Lots of squirrels. How many of you have seen this movie? I freaking love this movie. If you haven't seen it, if nothing else, watch it for that exact moment. All right, this is more of a plea. For those of you that are granted the ability, and myself included, to stand up here and take everybody else's time for an hour, don't just say what shit's broken. Figure out how to fix it. For those of you that represent a company, I will ask nicely this one time, and then I'm going to taser you. But if you stand up here and you say that my blue blinky fucking lighted solution that's coming out in 2017 is going to fix all the problems, I will taser your sorry ass. And I will stand approximately 12 feet away, so one prong goes in your forehead, and the other one goes in your groin. <laughs> and it is about 12 feet. If you get 12 feet away, you can actually get the two prongs in exactly the right place. 
Because the 2017 orange blinky light that replaces the 2016 blinky light isn't going to fix the solution any better. One, because it's probably implemented with default user IDs and friggin' passwords. And the second one is, for crying out loud, take some of that money and educate the very staff and the very people that are using the damn systems. So at this point, you can probably understand why we didn't want the feds in this place. All right, quick call out to the NSA. For crying out loud, if you do have all of our emails and you are scanning shit, would you please get rid of the spam? <laughs> so in closing, as with all things, there are actions and there are consequences. There is the capability Hi folks, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, I had a problem with the Ava Media Capture Device again, and we have no audio or speaker movement till the end of this talk. Sorry for the difficulties.